All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Deer Gear Podcast. On last week's episode, I sat down with Dorge and Dave Murray to talk about kind of the fundamentals and characteristics of field points and how that translates to your broadhead design. We talked a little bit about fixed blades at the end there, but in this episode, we are finishing the fixed blade broadhead characteristics talk, uh, two blade, three blade, four blade, uh, cutting surfaces, interactions with air, aerodynamics, a lot about the design of your fixed blade broadhead. And then we finish the conversation talking about mechanical broadheads. What makes a good mechanical broadhead? Why did people start shooting mechanical broadheads in the first place? And are they effective? So after this conversation, it kind of wraps up the broadhead talk. And the next time you hear from George, we're going to talk about material properties. So uh, specifically for archery components, so brass, aluminum, titanium. What does each do for you? What are you giving up if you choose brass versus aluminum or titanium? So it's a really interesting conversation. It helped me a lot with building my arrows. I am currently in the process of building a set of arrows that is pretty much a complete 180 from my last year's setup, and it is pretty technical. So when I get that finished up, I will fill you guys in on exactly how that's going, exactly what I'm shooting. So you guys have an idea of what I have learned from Dorge over the past 10 episodes. One quick announcement before we get into this episode, you do still have a couple days left to take advantage of the upgrade program. So if you have not heard about this, Exodus for the first time ever is accepting trade-in cameras to upgrade your trail camera game. So it can be any trail camera, working or not, any brand, doesn't have to be cellular. You just grab an old camera that you have laying around or you have a camera on a tree that you're not super happy with and you've been wanting to try an Exodus render, well now you can save $75 by simply trading in that camera. How it works, I'll keep this pretty short. You go to the website exodusoutdoorgear.com, check out with an Exodus render or Exodus render bundle. Use the code upgrade when you check out we will send you an email with an RMA label to return your old camera to us. When we get that old camera in, we will then ship out your Exodus Render or Exodus Render bundle. So it's really simple and it's a great way to save some money and get some value out of an old trail camera that you have laying around and upgrade your trail camera game for this fall. That takes care of all the announcements. Let's get into today's podcast. All right, everyone, here we go. Back again with Dorge and Dave, my archery experts. And we, last week we talked a little bit about some field points and we started the conversation on broadheads. And we talked about mostly fixed blade broadheads in this episode, we're gonna continue that fixed blade talk and maybe we'll dive into some mechanical stuff. But how are you guys doing today? I'm doing great. How about you and Dave? I'm doing good. I'm doing pretty good. Hope everybody had a good week last oh, week. Dave. Dave, you being one of the uh, uh, what certified and trained fine art trainers, I mean, you test enough broadheads. I mean, you know, I mean, you have put enough customers. Tell me some of your funny experience with fixed blades. Um, fi fixed blades, I, I noticed that large, going larger than one inch, especially when you're shooting like Aerovane 3, can be more, can start to be a little bit on the finic finicky side when you start going past like 40 or 50 yards. When, for hunters that shoot 30 yards or 20 yards, you can get away with a lot. But for the guy who wants to push the envelope and start going past that, when you when, when you have uh, broadheads uh, to shoot like that, you you know, and, and with with veins that are high rotational spin, you really got to have a quality broadhead. And in the fixed blade sense, you kind of really want to stay one inch max or be a little bit under to get good accuracy um down range so we, we said there's there's issues with accuracy when we start to go with the larger head and there was also you know we tried some heads that were you know a, a loss of energy because they couldn't handle the spin rate being a fixed blade head um just to, just in in regards to that we're trying some of the several different um heads i've experienced as much as um eight inches of drop 
at 40 yards going with a even with a one inch head is comparing like uh, the, the Ram cat, the heart craft and a slick trick. Um, the Ram cat and the heart craft would hit about bullseye at, at 40 yards with an AV three vein is versus the slick trick, you know, was consistently dropping it at eight inches that it would, they would lose energy or, or, or well, you would better well, explain what happened. Actually, I can explain, but I want you to inject. What's the speed of that bow? What's the speed of the actual arrow? The speed it at the, uh, I believe the guy was shooting, we were doing the testing, um, the guy was shooting a Darton uh, DS3900. Um, I believe it was right around 60 or 62 pound um, with a, a 1.0 concept system in a Cheetah. And if I had to guess, he was probably in that 310 to 320 ballpark of speed. And this the hmm. slick trick just didn't it, it just it it did you know it, it would just drop eight eight inches consistently every time compared to the other heads that were the the same weight, um, same size one inch cut diameter head, and it just couldn't, you know, at that significant eight inches to drop it would expend that much energy. You know, just my my posture on that is. The broadhead wasn't made well enough, or or as in or as as good as the Ramcat or the Heartcraft. And I believe the Heartcraft and the Ramcat had some design characteristics. Correct. Like the like the scoop and the O-ring, and the, the Firenock O-ring technology on there to help that. Well, actually, I, I want to I want to point out very critically, for so most listeners can fully understand. A lot of stuff that Dave talked about, because he, Dave is a technically a, a fine art diamond dealer. He deal with Aeroving 3, and he was shooting at 310, 315 feet per second. If you recall on the times, it's on not measuring Aeroving 3. So in other words, the guy was shooting at a bow that is rotating an arrow with a bow with the arrow capability about 90 to 120 revolution in the first 20 yards compared to a blazer that's eight to 12. And at 40 yards, the arrow wing three is rotating about 215 to 230 feet uh, revolution, while a blazer only takes about 12 to 18 if you push. So the problem is that uh, Dave point out very critical. It is identical in length and width. That's where the characteristic of a broadhead and how the broadhead handle the aerodynamics because at that moment, you need to find, I mean, for the guys who have a little bit more physics and aerodynamic ability, you're dealing with fan law number one and number three again. The rotating, the rotating speed of the, pro, of the propeller object, because when you treat all broadhead, they got blades on it. When you got blades on it, it will, will comply with fan law number one and number three. There's no way around it. The tip speed, the interaction of the air, and also the blade size which is also blade angle. As the rotational increased, the drag coefficient increased geometrically. The only way to overcome this is to lower the pressure. Yes, Dave. And it also, but you know, aside from that, you know, the slick trick not having the double O-ring concentric design to go, I know we talked about this. Which is not critical podcast. at this point because we're talking it's one not critical. Okay. Okay. I mean, does that have any consideration that if it's off a little bit, as far well, as not and when you just reason the one inch size broadhead is so well. Just reason the moment you take Aeroving 3 on and you put, I mean, this is what I want to make sure so people don't confuse. The moment you take Aeroving 2 or even Aeroving 3 off and put blaze on it, all three broadhead would technically shoot the same. That is where the trick is. The fact is that you find out that the, the, the reason that the stick trick dropped eight inches at 40 yards compared to the crack craft and the uh, and, and the Ramcat is because of the of the scoop, which I when I talked to the designer of uh, uh, Brad Fulton of Ramcat and also uh, 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 Terry of Hardcraft, they both derived to a same thing, but they did not interact with, they did not con converse with each other for that design. But after you look at it from a pure aerodynamic point of view, the scoop, I mean, that's the same thing with the new annihilator, it pretty much identical to a Hardcraft scoop. That's the reason it flies so well. But un unfortunately, the, the annihilator do not have the cut like the Hardcraft nor the, uh, nor the uh, Ramcat. It will be great aerodynamically, but the moment it, if it exceeds three quarter of an inch 
I don't believe based on a pure aerodynamic, I mean, you can just calculate it out. It is not going to have the same effect. Does, that, so, does, it, does it matter that that annihilator broadhead is not vented? Yes, that's actually, no, not just that. The blades are part of the head. Okay. Now that's, that's where the George. difference, the blade is part of the head. Okay. The, the head that we tested that I mentioned was also the, uh, just to be more specific, the uh, SPG smoke, I think it was called. Yes. Um, can you go over as why they, you know, in, in fixed blade world, how this was a benefit that they actually had to back up. They, they removed the back section of the, no, actually of the, the smoke, uh, the, the blade. The, 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 yep. The SPG on a single blade. I want to find out a lot of people miss it. What's the difference between the SPG blade compared to the original Ramcat three, uh, the one and three, three eight inch blade? That is where the problem is. The problem is that you need again look at fan on number one and number three. The moment you go slide out on the edge, the tip speed, just like a fan, the larger the fan, the more air you interact with. The off, the more offset the blade, the less you interact with. Because remember, you need to think about your broadhead blade. They are interact with air at 90 degrees when you rotate. So, so you know, the, the smaller diameter blade size is less interaction with the air, All which right. but the, is going to result we did that with the, better accuracy. But when I saw that Brad did it with the Ramcat, but at the same time, like Highcraft was, was ported to the maximum. But then they also still have this cross. The, remember, you put your hand and you put your hand sideways, or just like very simple, put your hand out into the window. And, and when you're driving and you put exactly 90 degrees to the air, you're going to face everything. But the moment you slide it down to about 45 degrees, you can see your hand is your hand trying to move up. The moment you get closer and closer, closer to horizontal, it's the least. I mean, we know that we cannot possibly get the Ramcat blade to be any shorter than one inch. So what do I do? I grind the front and back of it. At least that's how I help Brett when he designed it. But when you grind the front and back of it, what do you just create? <laughs> An angle. <laughs> that's all it is. <laughs> I just do a single bevel to make it into an angle because since I cannot stop it from doing that, well, and not to mention you have to have an edge, otherwise it can't cut. I mean, aerodynamically, I should make it into a round, but that's not gonna do any good in cutting, isn't it? <laughs> right. But then now, that, uh, then I want to talk about. See, a lot of people talk about the cutting blade, the interaction with air. But I also want to mention something more critical because a lot of people just like a lot of people thought that. Hey, wait a minute! I got a four blade. I should not need to align. Or I got a three blade. I should not need to align. But I need to think. Do you really have a four blade? Because all three blades are true three blade, but the four blades are not true four blade. A lot of four blades are actually two blade with a bleeder. Now you're in the whole different ball game. Because you think about it, if you do if you do a four blade at exactly nine, nine o'clock to three o'clock position when you launch it, you are literally flapping the arrow and catching air, isn't it? Because unless, of course, if you have a four blade, it doesn't matter. But then if you uh, the E4 even blade, but the fact that you you got something like the the inflector or like the, well, the inflector design or which is very similar to the original Eastman Outdoors first cut XT design with or some of the more bigger blade. You got a two blade with two bleeder. That's what you actually got. Under that condition, again, just like every single two blade, true two blade design. You really, especially the guy who like those type, those are all over a one inch cut. You need to rethink your process. Yes, let me just bring it back. It doesn't matter how fast you shoot in this case. That is the launch cycle of the blade interacting with the air is what you're dealing with. So the way that you shoot arrow vein or not, or high speed vein or not, it do not matter. It matter because the blade interact with air in the launch cycle. Because see, your arrow flexes the absolute maximum on the first apex. That means the first bend of your whole arrow. At that moment, you want your blade to maintain 12 and six o'clock at all times, regardless. Am I helping? Yeah, yeah, no, I thought that was good. Good explanation. Good. Then, uh, um, uh, and then of course over three blade. Now, just like I want to sort of like wrap what I talked about last time, we said you want to make sure all the three blade at all at all times, which I learned it all the way since the, uh, the by Delta wing veins design, because they are the smallest cross section. 
The whole idea is that if you want a broadhead to fly reasonably well, you need to make sure the highest point of the broadhead do not exceed the highest point of your vein. That's simple enough. Mm. Because at that moment, you have an absolute master and absolute slave. You only want one master and your shaft is your slave. Just think about that. Oh, I see, okay. Hey, and that, when that some makes people, sense. And some people say, well, if I throw enough weight on it, it don't matter. Unfortunate fact is that it actually matter more. If your broadhead is humongous in weight, the now, moment you fly, is, go ahead. Is, is, is there any like relation to like, you know, back in the day when bows were slower, you know, we needed more like bigger no, veins no, no, no. to so control slow the heads? No, fast have no major factor. That's another okay. thing that people thought. Well, I'll say as far as the size goes, you know, people yes, want yes, to shoot yes. bigger broad heads and then we got these bigger veins. I mean, if on. you look at the history of mankind, and I do mean mankind. I mean, like most of the Aborigines and some of the, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, Polynesian people, their broad head are actually closer to four inch in diameter and about five inch in length. For them, it's simply a, a spear, a directional control spear. And you notice that another thing is that I want to point out, everybody whose life depends on eating based on what they shot, they always shoot the longest arrow. And you notice that they do not use compound bow because it's not available. It's not the speed of the bow that caused the factor, it's the compound bow. The, the entire duration cycle of the power given to the, the arrow is where the problem is. The longer that duration, in the case of a recurve, the power is from high to low. In the case of a high let off, it's low, high, long duration and low. That means your arrow will flex significantly. Because see, on the one, the, the arrow only have to deal with one cycle, which is a recurve, which is high to low, and that's the end of it. In the case, that's where the, uh, in, in those cases, the size of the broadhead is really not important. The size, the length of the arrow is not critical. As a matter of fact, the longer the arrow, the better, because you are going to absorb the cycle very easily. But you only have one split of second, it's a high to low. That's the end of it, because it's got zero let off. Now, let's, let's, I mean, I can dive back. I mean, we talk about this in our shaft design and so on. Maybe one time we'll talk about our cam design, how, how each cam is, how efficient is each cam and how they interact with each other and how we do cam pressure and so on. I think we should leave that for another day, but let's focus on the, on the broadhead. I mean, in the current market, we have three major connection system. Actually, we can consider four. I mean, with my days of hunting, I noticed that all broadhead, that really fly superbly well are the glue-ons. That means there's no insert. You literally glue the broadhead onto the shaft. By doing so, you guarantee the straightness, you guarantee the connection. Do you know that, I mean, one of the biggest things that I have discovered is that most of the broadhead, the moment you put it on, you do not put it on straight. That's when spinning is so critical. I mean, that's the exception to this rule, which is the reason I invented the uh, fact technology, which is final double O-ring. But if you really just shoot all any broadhead and you use insert systems, now that's, we talk about four different forms, which is the, the glue on, the basic X32 insert, okay? What other two systems do we got? We also got the, the Eastern Hip 6 for the 166, which is based on the 440 thread. Well, unfortunately, on a pure mechanical point of view, 440 is not more than 832. It's not. The thread count is high, but the entire teeth contact surface is lower. Because the only thing matters for the truly connection is the teeth connection surface, is how much power can that it pull onto the head. Of course, we are not doing with a like a like a head block of engine engine block. You have to talk the talk the boat to elongate it to tighten it. You know we didn't do that. So I would give advice to anybody, if you really use a broadhead and go on, string wax with your friend in a spinner. Because unless you use fact technology like the one I invented, you absolutely need to do that because if it don't spin right, that's your leading head. You'll never fly right. And the sad part is that the reason I suggest string wax because that was what I used throughout all my life until I just got mad about it. You apply the, the string, string wax to the threads? The thread and the, and the neck. Okay. Because what you do is that I'm putting enough string back to give the light to hydro flow. 
So that just in case when you remember when you impact, you also have caused the entire thing to go forward and backward. That's where the broadhead moved. Because see, the moment when you put it on, you notice a few times you can push the board to one side and then tighten it. Well, what does that mean? The broadhead is no longer concentric. That's the reason getting yourself a spinner, or even better, I will tell you one thing is better because when you do the 166, a spinner is actually not good. Because the shaft of the 166 on the wall thickness is not the same. So even if the shaft is absolutely perfect with the, uh, with the outsert or insert, and uh, with the insert and then with the blade, the, sh the entire system is not concentric. At that moment, the easiest, the best way is to get yourself a really good magnet and stick the product underneath and spin it. It'll yeah. give you all you know. You can't go wrong with it. And it's so easy. That's the reason in the old days, when I was when back in my, back in the 1980s, I always have a magnet on my quiver, which I put behind that screw of the quickie. And every time I put it on, put it on and spin it to make sure it's right. Because if you want to do any long distance shooting, if you don't do that process, you're, you're cheating yourself. And of course, the latest, the, the last one I want to talk about, besides the, the, uh, the 440, the 832, and the glue on is the newly invented and also patented the process, which is called the stalker system. In other words, it is not an insert. It is not an outsert. It is a stem that sticks out. And then some broadhead you right on top of it. And the latest one that, of course, uh, we have find out have been selling the, the stalker swing blade for two years now. And uh, we are thrilled to say that we actually licensed that technology to, uh, to Swacker. So you're going to see that on 166. I think that is a really good way to handle the 166. That would be your four methods of connecting an arrow to, quote unquote, with a broadhead. Which pretty much conclude our process of talking about fixed blade. And we still got about just half, over half an hour. I want to talk about mechanicals. Do you know why mechanical comes out, any of you? Why did it ever come out and when did it come out and what's the first? I don't know when but I would assume why would be to fly like your field tip, to, to be yeah. closer to your field tip. Yes, I'm and, with yes <laughs> that exactly is the original reason. Let me give you an idea. The first so quote unquote mechanical broadhead of that is a mechanical board that's about two inch long. And you stick on four blade, uh, two blade on each side. <laughs> yep, I remember, I remember the shape, I can't remember the name. And the first truly successful mechanical broadhead that comes out was the original Gators. That's made by Rocky Mountain. Well, guess what? It is identical in theory, size, shape as your rage. Mm. <laughs> but the, the, when, when Rocky Mountain Gator comes out, they, a lot of people like it, but instantly a lot of people discover what the problem is. Is that the, uh, the forward scissor action, the, the forward, no, the forward swing out scissor action is not ideal because the blade actually moves downward and out. If it's not point blank at 90 degree into it and at an angle, the cut is questionable and you end up with a flip over action. That action is much better. I mean, to be fair with you, my personal take is that the absolute worst is the if you do not point blank, that means the broadhead do not hit the animal at 90 degree. The worst broadhead you can possibly use is a broadhead that, that the blade from the front open sideways to the back. Now just imagine this, your blade from the front at about five degree, go to 90 degree and then swing to 160 degree and settle. Is that because it's taken up like energy on impact? Oh, absolutely. It? It's not just energy. Now imagine if your if your angle, if your broadhead is you cut into an animal, say at 45 degree, no, at anything more than 15 degree or more, and the blade caught the skin first, what do you think is going to happen to the arrow? The arrow is going to swing just like the broadhead. So you're going in about three inches and the arrow swinged, then the arrow dropped off the animal. Because what happened, the mm. scissor action kicked the arrow. The arrow by moving lost all his energy in the entire arrow movement. I Which had a, a guy, we were hunting wood out in the field and he was shooting a, uh, I believe it was a Matthews. 
and he was using a rage a rage head actually he used three of them i think that that same set he <laughs> shot a uh he he shot the deer like maybe i i forget the exact yards i want to say like 30 or 40 yards or something and he had little to no penetration it was in an open field the deer ran all the way down to the field uh where he's seen it go in well i'm talking like over 200 near 300 yards we couldn't find one drop of blood found it laying off into a in, into the woods a little while right and he pokes another arrow at it deer takes off again we track it another 60 70 yards he and we find it laying again and he throws another arrow into it and uh you know finally it went a short distance and then died but all three arrows had like very little penetration the one that did it um was a very close range shot well but mm -hmm. there was no penetration on 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 the arrow well this is not the actually it's not the broadhead's fault it's 100 percent the arrow setup let me explain I, yeah, the whole thing was a the, that between the arrow and the broadhead was just not the right setup all right remember we talk about that range what happened when you increase the angle of your broadhead towards the animal all things we do not like happened that's where some people right. like fixed blade because at that moment that is no movement of the blade that's only i mean that's the reason you know if you want to shoot uh say mechanical you like you're, you're fond of rage go with the rage hypodermic you know why because it's a longer penetrating tip so the the tip gives you a directional control of how that the rest of the rider going to come in just like when when you do a drilling you need to ascend a punch first so you get a guiding pilot. You will drill a lot easier. But the fact is that on a, on a normal range, the moment you go, you do not give you, I mean, it is the same thing why, uh, 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 say, a uh, uh, new archery product, you, uh, you call the Spitfire and the Spitfire XT. Why do you think the XT seems to penetrate better than a normal Spitfire? Because the XT got a cut on contact blade on it. So it gives you a directional control. So just in case the scissor action from the side kicked in, remember the front is a front to back swing. That's what the action is. You can't deny it. Just like if you put on a piece of paper and you and you look and put your blade down and now I'll, I'll see how the blade go from front to back. That's a huge gigantic action. That's over 130 degree of the blade action on it. Minimum 120. Okay. What, what, that is. Mm -hmm. what, what, what I noticed is, you know, being going on different forms and stuff, you'll see, you'll see a topic, you know, that uh, there's the issue of the guy had a, a good experience or a bad experience with a, you know, a, a head like a rage and like in the vertical bow world, you'll see just say 25 comments that people had success with it and 25 comments that people absolutely hated the head. And when you start reading some of the, some of the comments, I've noticed that the people that had good success with it will shoot a heavier setup compared to the people who had a lighter arrow setup. And my thought behind that was the amount of weight made up for the energy lost on a lighter weight arrow when going, when, when penetrating into the animals, basically the reason why they were able to achieve such. We don't see too much going on in crossbow world because you know from in, in my sense building heavier heavier bolts um it, you know you got a significant amount of weight we're talking like 500 grains going at the animal versus well, somebody absolutely. trying to shoot like a 300 grain arrow but this is again we need to think of things through fold first of all the, the broader design the speed because he the, the that is reason mechanical head i don't recommend anybody shooting mechanical head unless it's like something like a swing blade design that we patterned. <clears throat> you pretty much can, the moment you drop below 45 foot pound of energy, you're in trouble. But then with the new, with the new high, high let off cross uh, vertical bow, it get a whole ton worse. And that's the reason people say, oh, it doesn't penetrate and so on. They need to think about it. If you should high let off, if you shoot the animal at 20 yards, say you're using a 166 at 20 yards, you need to reimagine because if you go ahead and shoot your arrow at 20 yards into the target with the 166, at 20 yards, did the arrow go in the target straight? If your answer is no, you just answered your own question already. 
If the arrow is not going in straight using mechanical, you just added whatever degree that brought her had to overcome before you get into the real trouble. Say if your arrow is flexing at 15 degree at that moment. No, let me make it five. And the critical for that broadhead is 10 or, or even go 20. So you know, let, let's make some assumptions. Assuming that broadhead, the critical angle for it to not to perform is 20 degree. You shoot, sure. an, you shoot an animal and walking away for you and shoot at 15 and your arrow just flex five degree. Guess what? That's 20. You're there. <laughs> You're there. <laughs> I'm so, using, oh, no, so, it's not that important. Hey. So, so we like, could really have an issue. Um, I mean, everybody, you know, that I, you know, loves the idea of a quarter, in, a quarter in a way shot on a deer, which would, you know, put the deer at an angle. But when you're using a, an expandable head and then have the issue of the, the blade angle contact, we could have a glancing shot. It's really not optimal. No, no, no. It's not a glancing. Deer. It's a glance off shot. Because if the oh, blade yeah. and the tip touch simultaneously and the blade try to open, the arrow will now flip 45 degrees away from you and drop off the animal. You only get about three inch penetration. I mean, the sad part is that this is what I remember somebody say. This is called a hunting law. If it's going to happen 1% in hunt, the moment you hunt, that one percent is going to be fifty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you, in my case, it's hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, it's like it only happened in one percent. Why me? But guess what? Every now, time you, you hunt, you shoot. I shoot an animal back in my other days. That's exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> now, in, no. in in regards to the scissor back like motion, where the blades mm -hmm. are going uh, back from point to tail. Mm -hmm. Your swing blade has a little bit of a unique feature that it's a mechanical, but it doesn't do that. No, nope, actually, that's the only thing on earth that doesn't do that. But let me try, try to guide the guys to think the process. Current mechanical have only two forms. Two forms. The blade, I mean, just like when you look at the, the, the process of the, say, a, a, a G5 you know, or, or, uh, or the Rage, which is based on the original... Uh, uh, Pattern, which is from uh, uh, Rocky Mountain on the Gators. The blade push down, not give angle, you got a wider cut. Okay. In the case of the, the, all the rest is that the blade is forward, you swing backwards. Now you got a 120 degree swing. Those are the only thing. I know about front to back, front to back, open sideways. What does it all mean? They all mean that every one of this head, except the one in G5 which is a very well designed. It's a MIM design with a re re replacement blade. That's a nice one. Or the one from uh, uh, another company who would make it extremely mechanical challenged that it simply got a, got two hinge action, but still at the end of the day, it's, a, it's the blade that sit technically close to straight. And then when you push down the blade move backwards on a, on a hinge, actually on a hinge and um, on an axis, and then the blade goes sideways. To give you the maximum cut. If you look through all this, three issues. The first of all is that you're dealing with the, the broader being long. I mean, to some design, the moment you have a long broader design, especially a blade is long. I mean, you got cut. But the fact is that when you do archery, do you how big a cut do you really need? If you really want that big a cut, maybe you should give up an archery. And let's go stick back with the original recurve. Then you can all the big size you want. On compound bow, in today's compound bow, anything up to 2015, I really think that you need to rethink how big a flying cut do you need. My personal opinion, if the blade do not fly in the open air about three quarter inch or smaller, you're not gonna get any good speed out of it. I mean, let me, let me record, reserve back. At 315 and up, is this not good? Yeah, that's a that's a good point because I see you know you hear a lot of the guys that go for mechanicals, they want that big cut and the 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 throwback to that is well if I miss the vitals, I can cut the back half of the deer off still when the deer dies kind of thing when not realizing that most likely part of the reason why they miss the vitals is because of the broadhead issue that has all that involved into it. Well, it is like simply like a big 
anti like a big gigantic uh, switchblade over a surgical blade. My personal opinion is that the moment you start shooting today's high speed, high level of compound bow, you can't think of those because they don't work. You need to think about surgical precision, surgical blades. And surgical blades are never big. You need to be small. Now, I mean, the, the whole idea is that the reason that, that people go into mechanical is because they can't fine tune the aerodynamic factors. And then if you go back to a gigantic, say, a uh, uh, um, mechanical blade, it's long length, you can have all your problem again. And yes, I know some crazy people out there make, they put so much weight on the insert, gigantic amount of weight in their insert. Does that help on mechanical? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense of if you should, the speed would certainly drop. So your aerodynamic drops. It's not that the weight helped, it's that you actually drop the speed to make it work because aerodynamic no longer matter as much. <laughs> Below the it 270 is, feet per second threshold. Right. Because at that moment, at the same time, people say, oh, uh, I just make it work by putting on feathers. Do you know what you actually did? Because you, you put feathers on it, it, you sort of increase the speed of the arrow, but you also increase a huge amount of drag. That means that you just lower the speed of that entire arrow launch cycle so that your product will fly right. Now, George, how yes. does, when we're talking about broadheads mm -hmm. and the aero concept system, mm -hmm. how does the aero concept system help benefit an oh, aid? Oh, my gosh. Bit of broadhead? Where do I begin? We can just talk about a whole episode on this. We, I mean, since we're talking, I mean, we are pretty much at the end of the mechanical, but that, let's just jump into this. This is interesting because it, it literally changed. You need to, just like with the time we talk about the entire arrow flight, the parabolic action of the shaft, you need to think about a 90% of high let off bow, the parabolic action of the shaft is like a tuna. With the kissing point of the tuna as your knock, the cross section of the tuna tail as your arrow rest, the end of the fin as your broadhead. The moment you put an arrow concept system in it, you change the tuna shape into a macro shape. Yes, like a king macro. Your entire arrow, your, I mean, the sad part is that until you go arrow concept 2.0, the, the, the kissing part of the tuna still maintain, but the tail part significantly decreased the angle, which means that the entire action of the blade going up and down is decreased by about 600%. Now, all, all that's going to come to, to resulting in the arrow having more energy behind the point. Yes, because you're adding weight. You're adding weight, right. you're adding stiffness of the shaft. Because remember, just like I said, for most of the uh, mechanical head or the newer compound bow with highlight off, the arrow take longer time to recover. That means the arrow is flexing in the air in a longer duration. Which now means that when it that hits- pers uh -huh. Just to put that in perspective, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, I'll just up the spine. But the problem is the in, they increase the, the memory shaft effect. Weight. Yep. They right. increase so, shaft weight and also the memory effect of the shaft. Remember, the spine so the, is the spine weight is the is is a, a is a coherent uh, response to the entire oscillation cycle. But the the doing it with the concept system, we can keep it. the shaft weight that we can keep the shaft weight the same. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have the components that are so versatile in the concept system. You, you know, we, we have the uh, aluminum inserts, you know, with the wall that, you know, equal, you know, was it around like maybe uh, 70 to 80 grains um, that helps stabilize the shaft? Well, it depends on what you use. This, this is where I, I really think that we need to point out the difference because a lot of, a lot of uh, listeners come to me and say, well, you talk about crossbow again. Yes, but then let me, let me separate the two. In the case of a vertical bow, on a basic aluminum insert, you got 18 grains, okay? The concept system, you're gonna add 50 grains to it. But then in the case of vertical bow, the benefit is that the, 80, the, the 50 grain is gonna spread over a seven inch area. Right, so we're, we're, we're broadening, not only are we broadening the node, Mm -hmm. but we're utilizing that weight across a bigger spectrum instead of- Correct, but the, but the right final impact weight did increase. 
Now I noticed when, like on on the, some of the high speed videos that I did, that on impact, the 1.0 system, even with 175 grain trauma hawk, when it impacted the dyed water bottle and then when it impacted the target, the front several inches of the arrow held solid. Did not. We didn't. Yes, see, it wasn't that's any. Where, that's where remember we talk about a tuna to a macro. Because the angle yeah. of that flex is just significant decrease, which significantly increase the efficiency of a mechanical. In other words, if you want to shoot a mechanical, you need to absolutely dead set against when the arrow hit the target. The arrow is exactly at the angle you want. Remember, we just talked about it. If we the arrow flex five degree, you're shooting an animal at a fifteen degree, to uh, say away shot, and if the arrow is flexing your chance of hitting 20 degree exists. And you, we all talk about in hunting, anything that will go wrong will absolutely go wrong, especially when you are hunting. I mean, if you are with as good luck as me, that happens every time. <laughs> There's no way around it. It should happen on the way I'm doing it. <laughs> and, and I don't have to tell you, it happened with everybody that I know. The more you hunt, the more it happened to you and no one else. <laughs> So in other words, the only way to guarantee it don't happen is that you pretty much have to make sure it never happened to start with because it will happen if you are hunting. <laughs> At the moment, you don't want it to. Exactly. Because it can happen, it will happen because you happen to be a hunter. <laughs> I mean, I don't care how lucky you are. I mean, you are one of the one, maybe. I know a few friends of mine who happen to be that lucky. If you're that lucky, I'm pretty much guaranteed that some of some of your luck just ran out on other stuff that you don't want to tell me about. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I want to talk about uh, the, and just sort of do a little bit advertising for myself. You know why swing blade worked, but others don't? Because see, when I designed swing blade, well, I'll tell you a story. Uh, one of the very, very, very prominent um, industrialists call me. He said, Dodge, I got all the money, but I don't have time to practice. I need a head that absolutely fly right if I practice my field points. I mean at all speed. I say, well, that's pretty much all they say. No, 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 you don't understand. I need you able to screw my field point out and put your brother on that morning and shot an animal I need to know is work good. I say, that's a ridiculous tall order. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that is a ridiculously tall order. I can't imagine, you'd have no idea how tall order that is. And I mean, he talked to me for about a year and a half. And I'll tell you how I invented this process. I in was 10 minutes. Up, yep, in 10 minutes. I that's was going the, up yeah, to, 10 minutes. That's, that's yes, the thing between me and George. <laughs> I'm moving up to Chicago. And then I saw somebody open the door while driving. And then close the door back. And we are moving up on Highway 55 at easily 65 miles per hour. What does that mean? Somebody just have a mechanical movement. The car did not swing. He closed back the door. Everything go forward. Think about every single broadhead mechanical you have. Can you open the blade and close it? What mean thing forward? No. You cannot do that. I'm still trying to grasp the, 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 uh, the conception that somebody going down the road watching the car door open is going to relate that to a broadhead. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the difference between us. Sometimes they, they didn't call me crazy scientists for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> because that is where the thing come by. It just out and hit me. I said, why not I put a hinge on, uh, on the blade? I actually had to invent the freaking manufacturing process to make it happen. But what it does allow me to do is that because every single movement in all every single mechanical broadhead, the moment the blade moves, the energy is consumed. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Now I need, I mean, if you move, it's gonna use energy. How about if I you if you I, if I put a single bevel grind to a hinge the blade, that means the blade is gonna open when it cut. That means if it's not cutting, it's not gonna open. That means if it's cutting, the cutting process is what causes it to open. What more do you want? That means every single action is utilized. So in, in essence, even though the swing blade is a mechanical, mm -hmm. it acts like a fixed head. No, you do not. 
No. It do not. If you do not act like a fixed head, it because see, remember in the case of a single bevel, a complex single, like in the case of a, 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 our single be, a complex single bevel, like the the dagger, the mm -hmm. moment you go in, you actually create not a, not a slit, but a rectangle. So that is mechanical movement of the blade from left to right in rotational form. That energy okay. is used, which now gives you a much wide, bigger opening blooding trail because it cannot close. That's the beauty of, sing of complex single baffle. A complex single baffle, when you go through an animal, that wound channel cannot close because the tip, the blade tip on the contacting surface is doing a perfect sideways tear. Just like when you cut something with a knife and you poke somebody with a screwdriver and you turn, that screwdriver hole is not gonna close. The blade, you can just stitch it. Now your your sling hole. blade is three quarters of an, of an inch cut. So at minimum, we're you got three yes. quarters of an inch cut. Because you, if your sling blade is totally closed at that moment, you still got a three quarter inch cutting hole. But remember your cutting hole is cut with a single bevel. Again, a single bevel movement is always from, from the closing to open, you give you a space of that. That's the reason single bevel in the case of killing animal is about the best. It is not the best for a knife, but it's the best for a blade to kill animal with because the hole that you created don't close that easily. Hmm. Interesting. Now second, the swing blade have one special characteristic is that the blade is open from the cylindrical body and out. So in other words, it behaves more like a propeller opening. It's an opening propeller process. Hmm. And the process of opening is 100 based on the ability to cut. That means if it doesn't cut, it won't open. Well, imagine this is one side of the blade going in and you hit bones that have not, not opened. You have not cut. But the moment you touch meat, it's cutting the meat. Now it open. But then we say, what happened if the blade is so freaking weak? The blade is only what? 0.5 millimeters. Have no, no, no string to it. This is where I thought people need to think about what the broadhead actually do. I mean, yes, you can't argue with the design of like a tooth of the arrow or inflictors or the, or, or the new slick trick solid head, one piece. They are fantastic if you are testing them on steel drums. They're beautiful stuff, especially the annihilator is fantastic. But then you ask yourself, when is steel drum season? <laughs> <laughs> what you're dealing with is the skin of the animal and open. By the way, skin of the animal is very, very tough. So the sharpness of the blades is there. But then you look at the entire history of designing a broadhead you cannot deny the efficiency of a troll card head. If you look closer at a troll card head, which is where Masi first put on all the broad head and the rest of the people, you actually got a mini scoop in it. In the case of fine art, we forego that because I want the absolute, uh, what you call it, the structure strength. But the troll card with a scoop on it is just so wonderful. But then- At a swing blade head, I shot with a Raven at about 400 feet per second. And this is the 75 grain one, which I believe is the aluminum body. Correct, but you still had the same uh, uh, 420 stainless hardened tip. Yeah, it, so I shot that into a steer skull and I penetrated two inches of steer skull, like 20 yards before hitting the, the back of the inside of it. And, you know, of course the blades got mangled up, but the, the, the body and tip itself, like nothing happened. Well, actually, I, I will tell you, a few of my customers who was practicing, they actually shoot through their tree stand with a one inch, one inch, one square, uh, with three quarter in the three quarter inch outside square, it go right through it. That's the beauty of a troll card, or, or what you call it, a pyramid tip. I mean, if anybody know when you want to put some power behind it, nothing beats a pyramid tip. And the troll card is a pyramid tip with scoop. scoop. That design is so good. I mean, cut on contact will never do that because then you're basing on the ability of the tip of the blade. Which, but in case when you're dealing with meat, that actually in most cases gives you directional control because cut on contact will always cut to start with. That's the reason like your, your, uh, your, 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 uh, your Splitfire XT is so good with that because it gives you a, 
just like you, you literally behave like a center punch before you drill. So we so we want to really one of the optimal ways of getting into the animal. Correct. You want to broke the skin, and at the right. same time so you want the wanna... freaking cut action. Just like do you? I mean, just like unless you're one of those crazy doctor who don't have access to scalpels, you really cannot beat a scalpel. The scalpel was designed the way it is, but if you really are the absolute, the pinnacle of any design of cutting, the only cut that mat that is the best on this planet is the designed, is how the, we need to look at again, how animal cuts. They tell you the best cutting surface is a jacketed, is a serrated cutting surface. The downside is that you have no duration for it. That's the reason you only find serrated blade on the back of the knife, not for the front. Mm. By a hard manufacturing process to get that down. Correct. And not to mention it's close to impossible thing. It's a one-time use. And that's the reason when you look at the micro micro surgery cuts, they are breaking off of crystals with serrated tip. When you look at a high power microscope, that's how it cuts. And if you look at all the, the entire history of all living beings, the one cut that is the most efficient is a serrated forward blade, forward angle cut. Guess where that's used? The tongue of a mosquito. You're just not going to find anything more precise, more able to cut meat. Remember, we're talking meat, not bones, meat. The troll cut will handle the bone. The blade will handle the meat. And people say, oh, I want this blade razor sharp. Well, you can spend 20 hours sharpening your blade. At the end of the day, the moment that blade touches the skin, it's no longer sharp. I mean, tell me, tell you, let me just so I'll give you an idea. If you shave like the old ways with a razor blade, the moment you go through hair, that's about as bad as it gets. So yeah, all your effort sure. is pretty much useless. I mean, if you've got anything over 40 pound kinetic energy, razor sharp, the moment he went through the first hair and then went through the skin, that razor sharp is pretty much not there anymore because he, if you shave, you notice, you got five freaking blades on your Gillette and you're shaving just your skin. How often did you change a blade? Yeah. Not even if, fast either. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. Remember, yeah. remember how when you cut, there's three factors. The speed of the cut, the force of the cut and how sharp it is. No, and angle. Cameron, gave, Cameron gave up on it, seems like. He, he, <laughs> he said she just doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, George told me it's not worth it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, so, you know, we can go dive deep into this, but I really think that we, I can literally give you an hour on each of the video design and find out. See, at so the end really, of the day. The, t the tip is so critical in oh, absolutely. the skin. Just to create the blades that go into the, um, you know, in, in the rest of the animal and do and do its job. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this this reason the the, the 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 funny thing is that everybody and the cousin is trying to find the next best broadhead. I think in most cases you don't unless you got breakthrough. Look at some broadhead museums and look at the blade. Every single thing is a rehash of what we have. But remember, you notice the size of broadhead keep on decreasing. Because they finally recognize. Now, just to, just to throw a just to throw a third arm into this a little bit here, mm -hmm. maybe touch a little bit on trauma hawk. Oh, it, I forgot about not that. Being, <laughs> not being sharp, just to just as a, I mean, that'll really. Oh perfect. yeah, I mean, th th that was th th that was a fun one. That was Wait, my first one let's, ever. Let's stall that blade up before we go hunting. Exactly. <laughs> See, this is where everything changes. Okay, and let me go back to the the, the history of American Indian. Do everybody should remember when we go through archaeology, the smaller head for the American Indian is for bison, for elk, for deer. The big gigantic head is for squirrel, chipmunks, your rabbits. Why? Blunt force trauma, recovery. Now we already know that. I mean, from the testing I, that, that we have done, that Brett had Brett from uh, the, the inventor of, of uh, 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 of the Ramcat. By the way, Ramcat is at this moment is still the freaking best cutting bleeding head out there. There's no, not, there's, there's no comparison. There's nothing out there. 
The fact is that you only take about 20, 25 pounds of KE to go through a 60 inch animal, like a typical North American white tail. That's the reason I tell people, if you're a lady who don't have much poundage, don't look at anything, stick with ram cat, you'll be fine. But then imagine you are now shooting, say a Scorpion crossbow, the old one, the LDT 165. You got 425 feet per second, technically, you got around 160 pounds of kinetic energy. You put a ram cat on it. When the arrow touched the deer, it got to go through the deer. And we said we spent a ridiculous of 30 pounds of KE. How many KE is still on the shelf when it passed through the animal? 130 plus. So one day I say, wait a minute. Well, I was actually happened to be reading, reading some articles on how when you want to do home defense, you a three three fifty seven Mac and a forty four Mac will stop the person. Wow, if you shoot at twenty two, you'll kill him, but he will have forever and a day time to kill you because the arrow, the the, the bullet would go through the person so fast. Yes, you killed him, but he have so much time. There is no transfer of KE. Now, for all the all the guys who uh, who like to hunt turkey, I was just confirmed. A lot of my customer have decided to use the tramahawk on crossbow on turkey. Why? Mm -hmm. A tramahawk take about one hundred and thirty pounds of kinetic energy to go through a white tail. That means now you can use my tramahawk. By the way, no need for sharpening. Just just sort of touch it on the ground a few times to blunt the blade. So that you can shoot a turkey at that moment. Guess what? You're gonna put 150 pounds of kinetic energy at a turkey. Remember, when you shoot turkey, you either lop the head off or you shoot at the vitals, right? Otherwise, the turkey is gonna fly away with your arrows. But now, if you use a crossbow or a trauma hall, you're transferring 130 to 150 pounds of kinetic energy on that turkey. You can shoot anywhere on the turkey, even on the freaking breast meat. That turkey would just a die. body shot, just mm -hmm. cripple a turkey. And I, you know, you could put multiple shots on that, just touch it up on a wheel, gets a little skip, skipped <laughs> up, and go at it. I mean, it's from a selling point, it sucks because you'll sell a pack of broadheads to that. And the person that utilized the broadhead utilized that trauma hawk. I mean. You well, don't have to tell me that. I, I, I'll tell you what happened. I mean, uh, I'll confess. It's a, it's, it's a one time sale. I mean, I, I know that's I, the problem. I see, with Manuel, one of my very good customers from uh, actually from New Jersey, he's a, he's a funny Italian. He used to buy 12 packs of Ramcat from me every single year when I'm selling Ramcats. And one day he said, Oh, she's just costing a lot of money. He said, Are you killing deer? Yeah. I said, Go ahead and try a pack of uh, a pack of Tomahawk. He have not bought a single pack of broadhead since 2016. So it's yeah, a bad deal. Yeah. So I don't, yeah. I mean. You should have made the thing with a replaceable blade or something. I don't know. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, if anybody looks at it. No, you, you no, no remember you that's for crossbow. But then uh, right. I, 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 for vertical bow guys, yes. It's what I just said. Now, you now George, the, I, I did put that on a cheetah arrow. And I shot it at the target. I didn't have my pin sights in there. Uh, so I, what I, it, it hit right below. This was my first attempt. I shot it at like 60 yards. So it hit, the, it hit the ground in front of the target. It skipped off and hit a tree. And I got a video on my Facebook somewhere this right? That the trauma hawk embedded into the tree, almost the whole darn thing, right? And I, it broke the arrow off. I pulled the trauma hawk out of the tree with pliers, and it was like brand new. If I pulled, like if I pulled it out of a pack, I know I, I just built it too good. But but then don't tell people well, that. that was on a that was on a vertical bow. I, I mean, know I, that and, because and, and and that is guy, where this is where we're shooting. hitting. Remember, you are using arrow concept arrow. It's got a human amount of front of center. This is where arrow concept arrow allow people to do huge front huge front of center and still fly right. Because the arrow shaft, as I begin, go back to the tuna to macro issue, 
the angle of the broadhead is minimum. The moment the, ang the arrows are flexing less, the power of the broadhead field point, whatever you got on it, increase geometrically. And now in the, ca in the case of the dagger, it's the same concept, just with a yes. point geared towards yep. vertical bow. And I, I remember this like the day is long. We're sitting there, me and George are talking about how we're going to make the dagger, how we're going to get this dagger from the trauma hawk. And I got to tell you, George gets about as good as it gets with a grinder, him and a little Dremel grinder tool. <laughs> and he's sending me pictures of this. I mean, it looks like it, it looked like it came manufactured. That's how good George was with the uh, little hand device. And he says, oh, I can get it down to about 140, 50 grain, maybe 125 on the manufacturer. And then he sends me a picture. And it, it, within the scope of this, we're trying to figure out how we can get it lighter yet. And I said, George, you make everything else out of titanium. And he goes like, oh, yeah, a good point. So he makes, he manufactures the titanium dagger of oh, uh, the, the 100 and the 125 grain. Um, the, the 125 and the 100 were in stainless, but the titanium dagger was in 85, 85, 85 grain. And then subsequently from there, we go into the MIM daggers, which are kind of new as of, I think it was last, last season started now. 2000, uh, 2021. Yes, that's correct. And, um, now we got, now we got daggers all across the field up to what? Two, yeah, three, because two, at the end of the day, you can't beat a freaking solid blade. But then for yeah. for busy people like myself who don't have time to practice, who don't have time to really tune, feel uh, perfectly tune a brick blade, you can't beat a reliable mechanical that's well designed. I mean, right. That, that is where the the, more, the magic work is well designed and balanced. I think most people, the biggest problem is that they don't think of the whole thing as a system because just like you bought a brand new, brand new car that you wanted. Say you got a sports car. You say, well, you know, I really would like to do off-road, but you just go put off-road tire on a sports car. It's not going to work. You need to think of the entire system, every single piece of it. They all need to interact with each other. And, and I'll tell you what, the dagger is something that if you're even a traditional bow shooter, that's something that you want to look at because George has a wider range of these uh, daggers. And I've had a, uh, I've had a traditional shooter guy come over here with his recurve bow and his compound bow and take shots at like, you know, typical hunting range of like 30, maybe 40 yards. And it was, I was surprised that the 150 grain dagger was like, you know, within what was spot on with the field points at like 30 to 35 yards. Well, that's the reason, you know, for everybody, if you shoot a fixed plate, I always tell people buy extras, shoot the damn thing like you're going to hunt. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, you don't see every single problem you have. And if you want to know how good your, 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 your arrow flights, get a light enough on it, get your friend to take a picture of how the arrow flight is you will discover more things. Remember, listen to people like me or, or the so-called other experts out there. You still talk. At the end of the day, you are the one who holding the bow. You are the one who will release the arrow. You are the one who will kill the deer or whatever animal you're against that. Make it count. The more you learn, the more you find out you don't know. That's the absolute truth. I learned it from one of my old mentors. It was such a, such a good blessing. And I think I will end at that point. What do you think, Cameron? Is that good enough? Yeah, I think that was a great, great message to send people off with. Um, I look forward to next week's conversation, and I bet people right now are going to be spinning their heads thinking about their broadhead. Is my doing that? Is my broadhead good? So I'm sure we'll get a lot of questions. If we do get those questions, we'll be sure to pass them along. Beautiful, beautiful. Again, thanks for inviting me again, Cameron. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for being on. Yep, I'll see you guys. Thanks, guys.